Thursday, May 26th. Tonight on The National, flames in the forest, fire forces hundreds from their homes in Alberta. Postal retreat, you won't have to pay more for uncoded mail after all. And on the journal, Cambodia, a modern heart of darkness. Vietnam forces promise to leave this ravaged land, but that could mean the return of a savage regime. The National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening. A huge forest fire is burning out of control in central Alberta tonight, and more than 600 people are spending another night away from their homes. The fire is burning about 250 kilometers southwest of Edmonton. Last night, it forced the evacuation of the Sun Child and Ochis Indian Reserves. Tonight, a massive effort is underway to contain the fire and the damage. Bob McLaughlin reports. Fanned by hot, gusty winds, the flames are eating their way through dry timber. It's the largest forest fire in Alberta this year. It's only been burning for just over a day. And already, 40 square kilometers of dense forest in central Alberta has been destroyed. A massive effort is underway to bring the fire under control. Firefighters are arriving by the hour. There'll soon be 400 people on scene. There are water bombers from every part of the province and helicopters with water buckets. Bob Matheson has been fighting forest fires for 15 years. This is one of the worst he's seen. Bad. Very bad. It's very volatile out there nowadays. It's very dry. The fight is on to protect hundreds of homes on two Cree Indian reserves threatened by the fire. None of the homes have been damaged so far. The 650 residents have been forced to flee from the fire's path. They've been taken to safety at the nearby town of Rocky Mountain House, where they're getting food and a place to wait. I'm afraid for my family, our house, things like that. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things uh, that we hate to lose because uh, we're, not, we're not very rich people. Meanwhile, back at the fire line, they're bringing in equipment to camp out tonight and for what could be many nights to come. That's because Alberta is tinder dry and there's not much rain in the forecast. More equipment is going to be brought in tonight. The fire crews say it's not an easy fire to put out. In fact, it'll be several days before this fire is contained. Bob McLaughlin, CBC News, near Rocky Mountain House. The drought is also causing massive problems for farmers all across western Canada. And drought relief was one of the main issues on the table today as the Premier of Saskatchewan, Grant Devine, held talks in Ottawa. Devine is also his province's agriculture minister, and he's looking to the federal government for help. Ottawa says he'll get it, but there's nothing specific yet about what kind of help or how much help. More from Catherine Wright. Farmers in Western Canada say this year's drought is shaping up to be one of the worst in history. With no rain, there is no feed for cattle, nor is there enough water. More than one million head of cattle could die of thirst or starvation, to say nothing of the crop failure. Saskatchewan's Premier and Agriculture Minister, Grant Devine, was in Ottawa today, and he decided to press upon the Federal Agriculture Minister just how urgent the situation is. I mean, it's just as dry as you can imagine. I mean, the grass is not growing. And in some cases, uh, uh, big areas where there was no runoff for, for dugouts, and, and so that they're now providing water out of wells, and they have no feed. Since 1984, Ottawa has spent $225 million helping drought victims in Western Canada. And Agriculture Minister John Wise says Ottawa will help again this time. Uh, please uh, keep your fingers crossed and uh, pray for rain because um, uh, certainly financial assistance is a, uh, is a substitute. But basically, it's a poor substitute uh, for rain. The two men talked about water diversion schemes. They talked about whether to move cattle to places where there is feed or whether to buy feed for farmers. And they talked about increasing crop insurance. But there were no firm decisions made, nor was there a dollar figure placed on the amount of assistance required. The agriculture minister said all he can offer today are assurances. That we have a full appreciation of the difficulty that's out there. We're in touch uh, with it. And um, we'll be following uh, recommendations uh, which, uh, which we receive. Saskatchewan's premier said he is convinced Ottawa will come through. I bet money on it. 
The next step is a meeting next week. Federal and provincial agriculture ministers and farm groups meet to finalize a plan of action Tuesday in Calgary. And that's not a moment too soon for Western farmers. Catherine Wright, CBC News, Ottawa. A ruling today in the shooting death of John Joseph Harper. The Winnipeg native leader was killed by a bullet from a police officer's gun last March. His death brought public protests and allegations of racism. Today, an inquest cleared the officer of any wrongdoing and concluded the shooting was an accident. As Gloria Lowen reports, Manitoba natives were quick to condemn the judge's ruling. Today, my hopes have been shattered by the... Moments after the ruling, J.J. Harper's family and Manitoba native leaders expressed bitterness and anger. You go and, you go and uh, kill a dog and the whole humane society would be up in arms. You kill a cat and, and the whole society would be up in arms. Kill a lean and what's happening? John Joseph Harper died early March 9th from a bullet shot from Constable Robert Cross's revolver. The next day, an internal police investigation cleared Cross of any wrongdoing. Manitoba natives protested. Some claimed racism played a part. They demanded and got an inquiry to determine the circumstances of Harper's death. During the two-week inquiry, Cross, the only witness to the shooting, testified he approached Harper, believing he might have been a suspect in a car theft. He said Harper pushed him to the ground and there was a struggle for his gun. Harper was shot. Cross denied pulling the gun out himself, denied shooting Harper. But the testimony at the inquest was often contradictory. Three young people who drove by the scene that night testified one officer had a gun drawn. Another witness said he overheard police make racial slurs. In his report, the provincial judge said those witnesses were not credible. He said Harper's response to Cross was the result of the utter distrust natives display towards police officers. He recommended police recruit more native officers. Winnipeg Police Chief Herb Stephen agrees, but says it'll take time. I, I know the natives don't trust us, and uh, it's unfortunate. But Manitoba Indian chiefs aren't satisfied. They want more answers. Uh, it's really amazing that uh, the police officer in the system could come out scot-free, blameless. But it wouldn't end here. Constable Robert Cross refused to comment today, but Harper's family intends to sue Cross, the city, and the police department. The allegations of racism in the justice system will be looked into. Today, the Manitoba government repeated. A full judicial inquiry into how natives are treated in the justice system will begin this fall. Gloria Lowen, CBC News, Winnipeg. New immigration rules are going into effect in July, rules to make it easier for families to reunite. The government announced the plan last October, but until now, no one was saying when it would start. Thousands of people will now be allowed to come to Canada to join parents, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. 135,000 immigrants will enter the country this year, 10,000 more than last year. Well, leaving the postal code off your mail isn't going to cost anything after all. The post office had planned to charge an extra dime for letters with no postal code or a wrong one. Today it backed off. The president of Canada Post said they made a mistake. The idea is wrong and would hurt customers. Mike Duffy reports. On the surface, it looked like the answer to the postal bureaucrat's dream. Charge customers 10 cents every time they forgot to use the postal code or made a mistake in the code they were using. Absolutely atrocious. This was just another thing that was invented. All of a sudden, all the phone calls came and people were saying, look, this is utterly stupid. But even before the opposition raised the issue in the House of Commons, the minister responsible for the post office said management had it all figured out. Uh, this ought not to have happened. It snuck up and uh, they uh, you know, sort of realized it was there last night and, and canceled very quickly, quite appropriately. And over at post office headquarters, they were breathing a sigh of relief. Better admit your mistake now than have a customer revolt on your hands. So, you know, the reason for doing this initially was a good operational reason to ensure that we could process the mail better. But if there's a chance that our customers could interpret that as being negative for them, then it, we don't want to do it. Um, we're, we will continue to encourage people to use the postal code. It's still the best way to mail your letter. While they won't make use of the postal code mandatory, officials at Canada Post are quick to point out that mail which carries a postal code gets to its destination a lot faster than letters posted without it. Mike Duffy, CBC News, Ottawa. Coming up on The Journal.
the prime of Ms. Jackie Burroughs, a unique, haunting talent and a hit in winter tan. Jackie is the bravest actress and one of the most startlingly original. But in Canada, what can a star expect? You stick it out long enough, he'll be okay. You get a gold watch. <laughs> you get a gold watch. Mary Lou Finley and the story of Jackie Burroughs, coming up on The Journal. The fishing and boundary dispute between France and Canada topped the agenda today as Prime Minister Mulroney met French leaders in Paris. And the meetings produced results. Both countries have agreed to resume talks to try to reach some solution to a long-standing problem. Who has the right to fish around Saint-Pierre and Miquelon? Our chief political correspondent, David Halton, reports that the new regime in France has reason to want a quick end to all the friction. The Prime Minister had been told in advance of his visit here that Michel Rocard, France's duly installed socialist Prime Minister, might be more flexible about the fisheries and boundary dispute. Today, after meeting Rocard, Mulroney announced that French and Canadian negotiators will soon be resuming their efforts to settle a dispute that has badly strained Franco-Canadian relations. The Prime Minister just said that uh, our negotiators are, uh, are meeting, are going to meet, and uh, we'll move it along. Mulroney may have been at least as flexible as the French in agreeing to relaunch the negotiations. France has met one of Canada's conditions for resuming the talks, the dropping of charges against the Newfoundland trawler arrested earlier this month for fishing off St. Pierre and Miquelon. But the French haven't yet accepted another Canadian condition, that they permanently suspend their requirement that small Newfoundland boats get French licenses to fish off the islands. France is only suspending the license requirement for three months. The East Coast dispute was also discussed today after Mulroney drove to the Elysee Palace for talks with President François Mitterrand. While the focus of the meeting was on next month's economic summit in Toronto, both leaders took time to assess whether their negotiators can break the deadlock over fish quotas and boundaries. Mulroney is obviously hoping it'll be easier for Mitterrand's government to make concessions now that France's former Prime Minister, Jacques Chirac, has been replaced by the less nationalist Michel Rocard. I, I, I sensed a, des a genuine desire by the new Prime Minister and his colleagues to uh, reach agreement with Canada. Uh, and uh, it was agreed that uh, we would certainly make every effort to try. The resumption of negotiations doesn't necessarily mean the French will make any major new concessions on the fisheries and boundary dispute. But the government here does have one compelling reason to appear more flexible in the short term, and that is in order not to damage France's bid to win the multi-billion dollar contract for Canada's new nuclear-powered submarines. David Halton, CBC News, Paris. Panama's General Manuel Noriega has blasted the Reagan administration's attempt to get rid of him. Yesterday, the White House said Noriega had backed out of a deal to step down at the last minute. Today, Noriega said talks broke down because Washington delivered an ultimatum he wouldn't accept. He didn't elaborate. Noriega got a hero's welcome this evening when he delivered a special address to Panama's National Assembly. He denounced what he called American economic aggression and said he will not step down or leave Panama. He called on Washington to lift economic sanctions against Panama and stop meddling in the affairs of such a small country. During his speech, Noriega made no mention of the drug trafficking charges the United States has made against him. Syria announced a new truce tonight to stop weeks of fighting in Beirut between rival Shiite militia forces. 7,000 Syrian troops, backed by 100 tanks, are due to go into the slums of Beirut tomorrow to make sure the shooting stops. Nearly 300 people have been killed since fighting broke out between rival factions in Beirut three weeks ago. South Africa's ruling National Party has been celebrating the 40th anniversary of its rise to power. The party has governed South Africa ever since it was first elected. As party supporters attended political rallies today, two bombs went off in Pretoria, injuring four whites. James Robbins reports on the party that proclaimed racial segregation and on South Africa's continuing anti-apartheid unrest. Forty years ago tonight, President Berta was one of the members of Parliament elected on the slogan Apartheid. President Berta played his part in implementing total segregation of the races, then later turned to limited reform. Tonight, in celebration, there was no hint of apology, no acknowledgement of past mistakes. 
President Berta told his party faithful the National Party was a wonder party. Forty years of continuous leadership unrivaled, he said, in any other democracy. The president did not mention the limits to democracy in South Africa, and there were no black faces in his audience to represent the majority still denied a vote. The ANC claims to represent the black majority and mark the anniversary with two bombs in Pretoria. Four white women were injured. Latest casualties in attempts to force change. A government minister called the ANC attack abhorrent. He condemned the group of liberal white politicians from South Africa in Germany today to meet the ANC. The neo-Nazi AWB rallied again tonight. The other pressure on President Berta from the extreme right, threatening white violence in support of its undiluted total racism and anti-Semitism. The AWB is only the most extreme organization of a right-wing alliance which hopes to sweep President Berta from power. But he believes he can isolate and contain the rise of the far right. The AWB leader, Eugene Tablanche, insists the nationalists are leading Afrikaners to destruction through reform. There was nothing, he shouted, to celebrate in South Africa tonight. In Cape Town, this is James Robbins for CBC News. An unprecedented punishment was handed down today in a South African courtroom. Two white policemen were sentenced to hang for the torture murder of a black teenager. The incident took place in a black township two years ago. One of the officers had led a group of policemen on a black bashing expedition. When one 18-year-old was beaten too badly to be let go, the officer told one of his colleagues to shoot him. If the executions go ahead, they would be the first white policeman hanged for such a crime in South Africa. The Reagan-Gorbachev summit is still three days away, but already the Soviet capital has been the scene of a lot of pre-summit activity. Some you'd expect and some you wouldn't. But as all the activity goes on, Soviet citizens seem more interested in Gorbachev's ambitious program for economic reform. It's a preoccupation shared by their version of parliament, the Supreme Soviet, where it's been a lively week. Our correspondent Don Murray reports from Moscow, a city in transition. Spring and the rituals of summitry have brought the Garden Brigade to the flower beds near the Kremlin. Moscow will bloom anew for this fourth summit in three years and for Ronald Reagan's first visit to a country he spent a career denouncing. Another Soviet summit ritual. One more in a relentless round of media briefings designed to showcase Soviet openness. Gorbachev's glasnost. Today it was the turn of the Soviet chief of staff to salute the new policy with new information. When I look at myself today compared to three years ago, he said, I've changed, thanks to Glasnost. And with that, he gave the first detailed official figures of Soviet troop levels in Afghanistan as of the May 15th pullout. 100,300. Jewish refuseniks calling attention to their plight are also an established part of the summit landscape. Today, they attracted a horde of cameras and a busload of security men as they demonstrated for the right to leave the Soviet Union. There was shouting and shoving, but no arrests. But for Soviet citizens, the summit and its rituals, even in their own capital, isn't at the center of their attention. Internal economic reform, the wait for change, is what preoccupies them. Change is being seen and felt, but so far only at the edges. Government-approved privately-owned cooperatives are springing up, selling lumber and building stone, creating fashion and attracting curious crowds, or creating another world, a world of Greek columns and fountains, in two rooms on a Moscow side street which now house the atrium, the newest of the city's 80 private restaurants, opened just two weeks ago by five former in-tourist hotel workers with $150,000 in loans. Valery Ivanovich, the maitre d'hotel, said after 17 years as a state hotel worker, he felt he could offer something better and make some money. People here have more energy and enthusiasm, he says, because we feel we can build something ourselves. That confidence seemed well placed when the government introduced a bill before the Supreme Soviet this week designed to encourage the creation of more cooperatives. But buried in the bill were draconian tax rates that would have drained almost all co-op profits to the state. In an unprecedented move, Supreme Soviet members demanded the tax rates be lowered, saying conservative finance ministry officials were trying to sabotage reform. Vitaly Churkin, a Soviet economist, says that battle illustrates the dangers to reform. No, it is a, uh, a force of different people sitting mostly at some medium le levels, which uh, are very much 
entrenched in the traditional thinking and in traditional approaches to which uh, people accustomed to generations. And uh, it is a serious force. The battle of the cooperatives may only be a foretaste of the confrontation to come in late June at a special Communist Party conference called to chart the future course of Gorbachev's reforms. For many people here, that is the crucial meeting. Its impact on their lives may be far more decisive than next week's fourth U.S.-Soviet summit. Don Murray, CBC News, Moscow. Well, they're champions again. The Edmonton Oilers won the Stanley Cup tonight for the second year in a row, for the fourth time in five years. The Oilers' victory was postponed because of a blackout in Boston on Tuesday night, but Edmonton had plenty of power tonight. They completed the sweep of the Bruins 6-3. to three. Here's the end of the game and the beginning of the celebrations. Ladies and gentlemen, from coast to coast, the 1988 Stanley Cup champions, the Edmonton Oilers have won it again. Team captain Wayne Gretzky accepted the Stanley Cup, and he'll also take home the Conn Smythe Trophy as the most valuable player in the playoffs. On the streets of Edmonton tonight, jubilation. You might think fans are getting complacent about Oilers Stanley Cup victories. <laughs> think again. And that's the National this Thursday night. Thanks for watching. For CBC News, I'm Peter Mansbridge. Stay with us now for the Journal.